not sort of too long today and stuff, but I'm just wondering uh, in regards to Hurt by Paradise, just when this, where this idea first came from, because you know when you interview people who are kind of uh, in bands and they have their first album, it feels like a collection of songs sometimes that they've been writing since they were teenagers. I was wondering if this movie is, is a collection of ideas that you've kind of, you have had in your mind for some time. I, th I think it is. It's kind of the film, the kind of plot and story came about afterwards. It was very much kind of a, por a portrait of these two women's lives where nothing really happens, but to them, everything happens. Um, so you kind of jump between seeing them sort of together, but then seeing them apart and then seeing them with like their parents and, you know, with different people. Um, so a lot of it was kind of looking at sort of them as characters and them as sort of people with big dreams, um, but failing continuously. Um, and when we, me and Sadie Brown um, started writing it, we, um, we kind of just, we just had like a lot of, I guess, situations where we felt were kind of, kind of hilarious, but also sad, like the literary scene, the opening scene. And yeah, and then Rob came into the writing process later on. Um, you, you had a series of really amusing vignettes, sort of, that, and then, and then you linked us together in the plot, basically. I just really did sort of dialogue writing, really, and, and wrote some of the conversation. The plot was already in place when you two did the screenplay, right? Yeah, I think I've always loved films like Coffee and Cigarettes by Jim Jarmusch, where, you know, there's like, everyone's just bound together by coffee and cigarettes, and they have these conversations, some of them quite intimate, and some of them just pointless. Um, but I think Hurt by Paradise is kind of a bit like that to me. Lots of scene, lots of sort of, yeah, vignettes put together, and then the plot's kind of a little twist at the end. But it... I kind of, I've always loved films where you don't necessarily um, feel like much is happening until, you know, a, a few weeks later and you think, you know, something pops back into your brain about, you know, a scene or a character and it kind of lingers. Um, yeah, because yeah, I love, I, I love the, the fact that not an awful lot happens necessarily. And some of my favourite films are that sort of, have follow that kind of like quite free structure where it's just sort of shadowing kind of real life. But from a kind of, um, um, from a from a more of a log logistical point of view and as, 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 you know, getting this film off the ground, was it quite hard to sell? Because even though yeah. the part of the film's charm is the fact that kind of, it's, it's not got these huge, big dramatic plot points, but when you're sort of sat in a room with people with the money men, you know, people that want to fund the project. Was it quite hard to to try and get this project off the ground? I mean, I'd, I'd say that neither of us particularly like films that are plot driven because because life's not plot driven, and the films that are plot driven often artificial and and fake. And and we wanted to make with our first film a film that seemed quite close to real life in a way. Yeah. So we shot it. The way we did it is we did it. We got. Uh, a really good exec producer, Hal Brothers from Ratcliffe, to support like the majority of the funding. And then we filmed it as cheaply as possible. So for example, uh, we moved flat during the shooting, So we, <laughs> but we crossed over. So for a month, we had two flats, right? So in that month, we then shot, cleared us up at one flat and shot that as Celeste's house, and then cleared it, uh, moved, then moved into the other flat and shot that as Tanya Burr's character's house. So we did, we did like, crazy sort of budget saving things like renting two flats um, and having them cross over just to, just to not have to rely necessarily on selling it into um, a sales agent distributor ahead of time but just get to make it and then show them it was good that was really the approach yeah we were kind of just I don't know we we a lot of the locations were sort of friends of friends and kind of wrote we kind of had them in mind when writing it but it was also it was also partly like an experiment to see like how low budget you could shoot a feature. So I mean, our shooting budget was seventy five thousand, and then you know we got nominated for the Michael Powell Award at Edinburgh, up against the Souvenir and the Beatles, like yesterday. yesterday film as one of the five British films at Edinburgh I thought we were, you know, up for that award that year, which was kind of amazing. So it was like trying to push it and see like what value we could squeeze out of that 75K 
and really max that out with lots of with it with an amazing crew who worked really hard and didn't get paid much money and people worked for like you know um less than their day rates and worked longer than their normal day it was really like amazing to to have everyone support on that and then kind of the way we filmed it was that we didn't have sort of we had two sort of main characters but then a lot of the other actors were just there for a day and kind of quickly shot their films some of them just half a morning um so we kind of were able to bring in some really great people and not ask that much of them um which was kind of it was a really great sort of way of doing it wasn't it because most people were like i can only give you the morning we're like right we'll do three scenes then <laughs> yeah that was, an that was a really efficient way of doing it too you know to to have the the strong character actors like Nicholas Rowe and Camilla Rutherford and Veronica Clifford, who are all really like, you know, good character actors, come in and do their cameo or their part in like a day or a, or a half day, meant that we could sort of afford them. And, yeah. and also they didn't work obviously for their normal rates either because they were supporting the production. Yeah, but I mean, you couldn't tell it was made on a on a such a low budget, and it's because I, I mean, it, I I felt that it depicted London in a way <laughs> that New Yorkers often depict New York with a real kind of affection and in a kind of cinematic way, but never veered away from feeling authentic. I was just wondering about how important that depiction of London was for you, because I know it's such a cliche when people say, "Oh, the setting is a character," but this feels like a very London centric tale. No, it is. I mean, I grew up in London and I don't know, I still am sort of, I still find it a magical place and I still feel that there's a certain romance to the streets. And I think especially Celeste's character, you know, most of the time she's on her own and I don't know, there's something when you're in that kind of melancholic state of just looking out of a window and it's that wistful dream state when you're wandering through the town and, and maybe you're hearing a song in your head or you're thinking about a poem or you're thinking of an idea that sort of like being on your own in a big city state of mind, I think, that we want to get out with, with like... And I also think a lot, of, a lot of times big cities are always depicted as really busy, lively places, but we kind of wanted to show a London which was more lonely and melancholic and turned off in a way, so kind of when you hear those big poetry monologues, you're kind of really tuned in to the words and the thoughts in her head, um, which was kind of... Yeah, we lived in a tiny flat in Central when we shot it. The flat that Celeste flat um, in the film was our flat when we started shooting, then we moved out of it halfway through, so it could become... It's like a little studio. No, we moved out of it at the beginning, so it could become location, we didn't we? Um, anyway, but that was like, it was a sort of like, love letter to London. I mean, I've lived here for 20 years and I feel as though I've got so many layers of memories with the city and you do too. Yeah, yeah, because it almost became, oh sorry, I was going to say, no, because the film, without maybe accidentally, became a kind of quite moving for me to see particularly Soho before everything that's happened this past year, because I went to Soho quite recently yeah. and it was, it was like, it, it didn't have that same soulfulness to it. I was walking down the streets and it was lacking something in your film. It made me just, it really reminded me of like what London was a year ago. It actually made me feel quite upset <laughs> in some ways. So I was just wondering mm -hmm. about the, um, if you think, yeah, in terms of when you watch it back now, does it, does it take you back? I, I did have that feeling when I watched the DCP that's gone to the cinemas the other day of thinking, oh, wow, Soho really has really in full life is really something. Mm. Um, there's, a lot, there's a bunch of films that are not really that well known or big. I mean, London films that I think portray London really, really beautifully, like Wonderland by Michael Winterbottom. Mm. Um, Within the Night, obviously, that is a famous film, but um, also London Kills Me by Hanif Qureshi. And there's sort of about the the poetry of, sort of quite ordinary bohemian life in London. And I think that that's, those were definitely references, but also just to show the city the way it is, but make yeah. it really beautiful. I think it's that thing when you go home after a night out and you're on the night bus home and you're looking out the window and you're kind of, you know, you're in that sort of hazy state and everything's been said and done and you're just kind of trying to get home. That was kind of the mood we were trying to make. <laughs> and I was, I was watching the film with my wife and she really enjoyed the kind of the authentic portrayal of kind of female friendships. And I was wondering, um, Greta, when you watch uh, movies, do you think that it's lacking somewhat in, in cinema? Is, is really 
really capturing the kind of essence of, of female friendships on screen. And is that something you kind of part of partly what drove this project was the 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 kind of want the want to try and, and to, to show it for how you know it to be? Definitely. I think when we were sort of writing the film, you know, both characters, you know, they they both seemingly are looking for a male figure. One of them's um, a boyfriend online and the other one's her father. But actually what you find at the end of the film is actually they're both really, it's more of a love letter to them and their kind of friendship. And, you know, they, it's, it's kind of, there's a lot of just like unsaid things. They're not necessarily the sort of friendship, you know, you know, you have friends who you don't, you don't sort of think are going to be that sort of meaningful in life, but they end up really being that sort of special person. Um, so I think, yeah, we were kind of very early on, we wanted to kind of portray that. But I think, I think, yeah, we're definitely lacking complicated female characters. And I think a big thing, especially the fact that Celeste's character, she's a single mother, but she doesn't really talk about it that much. Um, I didn't want that to be her downfall, the fact that she was, you know, a single mother and she's, you really feel sorry for her. And, you know, we really dwelled on that sense of her character. I kind of like the idea that Stella and Celeste, you know, they kind of became two mothers and out of circumstance, they sort of just fell into those roles. Because um, I think women, they naturally do just take on different roles without kind of having these massive discussions which sometimes Hollywood makes out that, you know, it's bigger than it actually is. So yeah, I think it was subtly showing relationships not to be sort of huge fun things, but actually just quite sweet family scenarios. Yeah. Um, and I was the, the, the scene at the start where with the literary agent, um, I'm just wondering if you sort of experienced similar things to that before, when, when you've had kind of <laughs> gone in with an idea of what you want something to be, and obviously for it to be, that you know trying to be sold as something else and then how how hard that is to in a career to to know where to make the kind of sacrifices and compromises to help your career but not lose what you're the essence of what you're trying to to do and what you're trying to be oh god i've definitely had a lot of those, <laughs> those meetings i've gone in with like a, a full-on manuscript and been like you know here it is boom <laughs> perfect <laughs> <laughs> and then um then we're Mm. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think ultimately, you know, whatever you create, you know, it's, it has to be your whole heart. And if you truly believe in it, you just got to keep pushing. But no, I think when I was 18, um, I kind of wrote to every single literary agent I could find on the internet. And um, I think one of them saw me. And, you know, I was convinced it was genius, but <laughs> very quickly told me to go home and keep writing. <laughs> and do, you, do, do you think that the, um, the fact that you have a background in poetry really helped uh, with, with making this project? Because you mentioned before the lack of kind of um, sort of conventional structure, but poetry in itself has this kind of freedom of, of, of it can go anywhere you want it to go. There's no rules necessarily. And I was wondering if you think that that kind of approach to art that you've had in your poetry um, sort of helped influence yeah. the way you kind of structured this movie and set this film up. What? That's a good question. No, it is a good question. I think definitely because we had a very sort of, I think only later did once we were in the editing suite, we after six months of sitting and staring at it and piecing it all together, it kind of became apparent that actually the way we were editing it together was quite erratic, but we were kind of doing it with, you know, the, the poetry narration. And yeah, I think there's a lot of scenes you kind of, you know, you expect to see characters and they don't come back again, or they do, like the mother character, she comes back later on. Um, you get these very intense sort of bursts of life. And I think, with poetry, the form of poetry, in just a few words, you can say so much, it's such a profound language. And I think, you know, life can surprise you at any minute. And um, yeah, and I think that on palm reflection and editing, that kind of, yeah, Robert's also a poet and an artist. I wonder what you think. Um, 
Well, I mean, also the, the poems in the film are the poems in Greta's new book, Tomorrow's Woman, which is, was, was published. Did finally, did finally get it published. It was published <laughs> in February, was published 15 in, years later. <laughs> it was published in February by Andrews McNeil, but when we made the film, she didn't have a deal for that book. So it really was like she was writing those poems. And I mean, that's what she was doing at the time. She was writing those poems and taking to people and saying, here's our manuscript, what do you think? So yeah. we were sort of filming what was happening in Greta's life in a way, but putting it in character and obviously the character is different from, from Greta. But um, so I think when you go into those internal monologues that Greta's character has in the film, those monologues are sometimes her writing the poems in her head, but there's sometimes also her talking to herself. So, so trying to define like that, that talking to yourself voice from which you often pull out your creative voice. So I'm quite interested in the way that that internal monologue is sometimes her composing poems, but it's also sometimes her being self-critical and saying, oh, that doesn't work, it's wrong. Or like, it's like she's saying, oh, like, oh, what the hell's happened with this or that? Or I forgot to do this. So trying to portray that conversation you have with yourself in film, which doesn't get portrayed much, really, I think. Yeah. And I was wondering, too, because obviously we spoke about London before, but um, it is... We do see, there are scenes as we touched upon at the start in Margate. I'm just wondering why you chose, why you both chose Margate for this for this story to to, to expand into because it's I, so I, I, I went, it's so beautiful. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I don't know. I thought it was kind of I'm, I'm, I just love the sort of Eastbourne Hastings Margate lost romance. Um, they're quite like lost places they're probably not really but in my head they kind of are and um i don't know i think we really i think we were so sort of wanted the whole online boyfriend to be such sort of like a mistake you know such a letdown that i don't know i just love the idea that margate was just filled with just ridiculous characters who kind of egged it on even further and it kind of became you didn't really feel sorry for her because it was just so ridiculous a situation um they didn't want her to sort of be victimized either um yeah so veronica clifford and um jason thorpe who play the two sort of mad characters in the bar um i mean they were they were just sort of hilarious, weren't they, to film? Yeah, we, we, had, we had Jason Thorpe and Bronco Clifford, their, their bar conversation, we could, have, we could have run eight hours of that. They were hilarious. They weren't really drunk either, they were drinking like fake martinis, but they were, they had such a good, they had such a great like great. improvised repartee in the bar that, that there's loads of that that didn't get in the film that's just really, really, really funny. And the thing we did kind of a lot was we would like shoot everything quite quickly and then we would just go back and shoot it again and we'd just say, right, this time we're just going to leave the cameras to roll for five minutes and just see what comes out. Um, but no pressure. And most of the time we kind of kept it in because that's when you get those really beautiful, just, yeah. Natural conversation moments, moments yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's funny, uh, Greta, because I, 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 when I saw the movie, I, I, I remember thinking straight afterwards that there was a feeling of Jamie Adams about it, who I'm a big fan of, and I actually know, me and Jamie know each other quite well. And then I looked on oh, your IMDb and saw that, obviously, you're working with him or have worked. I'm not sure where, where that is yet. But I just wonder about your sensibility seems so aligned with him as a filmmaker. So how, how pleased are you that you've had the chance to collaborate with, with Jamie on a project? Um, yeah, no, it's been really, really, uh, we met because his film was also showing at Edinburgh and he um, wrote to us and said he loved Hurt by Paradise and would love to do something. And then um, he sent us this quite mad um, script um, and we instantly were sort of, yeah, he's, he, he's a real sort of, He's, I don't know, he's somebody who's super prolific and just manages to make films and he's really productive. We basically produced the last film, Venice at Dawn. I mean, um, so, so when we did Herbert Paradise, we made a production company called Salk Youth, which is, is the production company that produced Herbert Paradise. And Salk Youth's second film is Jamie Adams' new film, Venice at Dawn. So, just, so basically, we then shot Jamie's film in this house that we now rent. So we just, 
<laughs> the shit film where everyone was like renting. It's basically <laughs> our filmmaking, like with and Um So, so that's great. It's a, it's a sort of, it's a, it's a farce. It's a sort of, um, in a way, it's a sort of update of an Ealing comedy or like a traditional like first, British stage farce. And it's it, first and London. It's, um, London film. So it's his first London film, and so far in the rough cuts, it's really funny. Jamie's a very, very funny man, and also, um, yeah, he's a kindred spirit in the sense that we're all interested in like working out how to shoot films really cheaply with maximum creativity. So it's like you know, what can you change in the way a film's normally done so you still get the work, but you really don't waste the penny and anything that's not completely necessary, um, and. Um, so, so with that film, we basically he so didn't yeah, stop. We, we've learned loads from working with Jamie too. It's been a really good. Uh, so, what are your what are your um, ambitions for the production company? Where what do you what what's what, what's the kind of because obviously, yeah, what what do you see sort of you you guys sort of investing in and trying to to get off the ground in in the future? I don't know. I think every time we have to move flat, we'll we'll have a free location and we'll shoot a film. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Are we moving? I think. Uh, <laughs> I think no, I think, I think, I think, you know, I come, I, I'm a visual artist and, and I come to filmmaking from a sort of art school point of view. So I come to it and I think, right, now that cameras are digital, now that you can edit it on a, on a laptop, now that you can, um, you know, do all of those things that relied on like big infrastructure before yourselves effectively as a, as a group, as a team, then, you know, how, how independent can you become? How how can you then free yourself up as a group to not be working for the prerequisites that, that a distributor or, or a Netflix or a commissioning producer or a big studio would make you box tick on, right? So mm. how, how can you therefore sort of buy your freedom by keeping the production really, really cheap in a sense, because then you're more free. Um, and also I think that we want to, experiment in terms of like how much poetry a film can contain, how painterly cinematography can be, all those things that, you know, you still have creative freedom within, even if your budget is small. And I think we will want to shoot bigger budget films as we go down the line, but we certainly want to, to learn on small films. And I'm sort of, I think it's, I think, I think there should be more small films being made too and more small films being you know, put on in cinemas and, and put on, on streaming platforms because there's so much creativity out there in young filmmakers mm -hmm. and there's, there's um, the possibility of just giving them more freedom than they already have, than they have at the moment. Yeah, it's, I just hope that you'll be able to get a sense for how successful the, the company is by how big a flat it is every time you shoot in it. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I wonder too, because obviously, um, I know obviously they, they, this film, I heard by Paradise, and, and sort of the movies you plan to make are really champion, championing sort of independent cinema and kind of this kind of DIY sense of filmmaking. But but Greta, you worked on the complete opposite to that in Harry Potter. Just wondering what you took from that experience, and how, how, do you think it really set you in quite good stead, stead to kind of to see the inner mechanics of a of a huge blockbuster franchise? And, and do you think that even though your films are very different to that, do you feel do you think you still sort of took a lot from that experience that's helped you as a filmmaker? Oh, definitely. I think it was such a privileged position, so young to be on such a huge set and. It was um, shot in Neeson Studios, which is an old um, airport. So you just get driven around from different terminals and each set is just something more ridiculous and more incredible. Within sort of every room, there'd be like its own art department and it, just the stuff they would produce. It was, yeah, it was, it was really amazing to have that from such a young age, but I think, what you, what you realise is, I think later now when you're making a film and you know, you are doing everything yourself and you're like, God, everyone, you know, you, you sat around on set as an actor looking at all these people thinking, what are, who are all these people? And then when you try and do it yourself, you're like, okay, every single person is needed. Um, you know, especially when you're making a low budget film. Um, but yeah, those films are just, I don't know, they're such a great escape movies and I feel like I, I don't know also I'm also really interested in making really almost documentary style films and fiction films um 
But it, yeah, but I think it's definitely was just an amazing experience. And, it, and I think it almost just feels like when you, it's quite satisfying when you do a film, you shoot a scene in a day and you, and you watch it back and you're like, wow, okay, we can move on that. I think that's quite, that's quite good. <laughs> Whereas most of those scenes take weeks and months and you're still churning over a tiny, you know, eating a bit of cake and doing it for a whole month. <laughs> 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 my uh, my final question is I got I better go because I have a, a puppy at the moment who is deaf. I can hear her whining next door. I think she wants to be fed. Um, but my final question was just obviously uh, what what's well. It's a sort of two part. Firstly, I was wondering what else is is next if you guys have got any other projects underway. And secondly, I know you played Slytherin student in Harry Potter. I just wondering which which house do you think you both be in in real life? <laughs> Um, <laughs> Rob looked at me in a really evil way just then. Where does the sorting hat go? I'd be something nice, like Hufflepuff. Yeah. I think the sorting hat already oh. fell upon your head. I know, no. I feel like no. Hufflepuff is quite good because it's kind of like, you know, they're kind of the odd balls. That's probably us. Probably yeah, we're Hufflepuff, probably Hufflepuff. Yeah. Would. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, next, what are we, we, we're in the process of making um, a film, well, the pre-production on um, a film called San Valentino, um, which is, um, how would you describe it? It's a um, sort of, it is an inheritance drama. Oh, cool. um, set in <laughs> Italy. <laughs> it's an, it's an it's escapist pastoral wander through an Italian summer inspired by such 80s classics as Room of the View. Uh, oh, I just interviewed um, Julian Sands just before this chat. <laughs> I mean, oh. Yeah, I just got off the phone um, now. <laughs> with, like, with like really beautiful flashbacks to sort of wild 70s parties. It's really like the opposite. It's the one film that will need a lot more budget than this to do, but it's a sort of, it's like the escape to Italy for the summer film. Oh, and we've finished, we've finished the script with a great young writer called Ed Zorab, and we're now in production, you know, pre-production for fundraising, and and you know that'll be a bit bigger of a production when it comes around. Um, and but it's got some really fun sort of like sister dynamics, and um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff which gets uncovered in there. Oh. Are there any scenes shot in your house? Or? I mean, there's plot. Is there any scenes shot in our house? No, it's set in Tuscany. But I do, I do want to us to be able to stay for a few months in the location house. You see, so we'll give up our house and we'll, we'll move to the location bit, house. Yeah. So we'll get <laughs> for like six months, yeah. and that's how we'll do that. Brilliant. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today, guys. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you both. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys. Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed. Yeah. Nice. Hey!